from Unity Church of Christianity in Houston, Texas. This is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational Christian church providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress with the Rev. Howard Caesar. We all recently celebrated the 4th of July, did we not? And uh, my wife Diane and I were uh, fortunate enough to be able to break away for a few days to go visit our oldest daughter in uh, the state of Washington. She lives in Issaquah, and uh, our oldest daughter and her husband and uh, their two children, our grandchildren. Uh, one is Dylan, who is two and a half years old, and the other is Brady, who just turned five, actually, at the end of June. So we went there and, and celebrated a little bit his birthday as well. And um, Brady, Brady is one of those l bright little boys. Uh, he retains a lot of information. and. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever he sees and hears. As a matter of fact, you can read him a book, and you can read it to him maybe two or three times, and then after that, he can almost read it to you. Uh, and he, he just memorizes what's on the page, and uh, it's, it's quite amazing. It's not that he can read, he just remembers what was said about each page as he sees the pictures. So anyway, he, you can tell him things, and uh, certain statements or lines, and he'll remember them, and all of a sudden, he'll come out with them at an unusual time. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of cute and, and humorous and meaningful and all of that. Anyway, we were watching the fireworks. It was the 4th of July, and uh, we, they live up high, and you actually, actually see the Space Needle in, for miles. And so there were on the horizon all these fireworks way far off. You could see them poofing, poofing, you know. And, um, and there was, uh, on the level that we were on, which was kind of where the kitchen and everything was, looking out the windows, we could see some of that. But there were some others that we, we could just tell were behind the roof of this house. So we knew we'd get above that just by going to the next floor up in the master bedroom. So Brady and Diane and I went up to the master bedroom up in the highest floor they had there and were looking out. And then we could still see again on the horizon way off little poofs of fireworks. And then all of a sudden there was one that was closer to the lo locale where we were that just went boom, big and bright and beautiful. And uh, Brady says, now that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what I'm talking about. And he said it a couple times. And so he knew and believed what fireworks could be and should be. And uh, by gosh, there they were. They showed themselves. And uh, it was so cute. Well, I say to you, maybe there are times that the bigger, the brighter, the stronger blast or realization of faith or love or strength or insight uh, is called for in certain circumstances, depending on what it is we may be facing. Sometimes we have to dig deeper or we have to have a bigger blast of the energy of the divine in these different ways. And God is essentially saying to us, now that's what I'm talking about, you know? It's, that's what you need to dig for. That's what you need to bring to the forefront as you go through this particular challenge, whatever it may be. And so, you know, it seems like we are in a time where people are becoming more open and receptive to hearing, listening, experiencing uh, other dimensions or realities, if you will, other uh, uh, insights, visions. And there's a, a greater sense of, of openness, I, I feel, happening. There's even um, books that are coming out and uh, mystical things. Uh, there's the, the book Proof of Heaven by Eben Alexander is one, just one example. But there are other things you can find on the internet. And, and there just seems to be more of a readiness. Uh, for some, not for all people, but uh, it's, it's happening, I feel. And uh, that's to preface, actually, a uh, reference I'm making today to a book that found its way into my hands uh, as recent as just this last Thursday. And it came with the mail. And uh, in the mail, there was a package that it was priority mail. And I'd, I put it down there and didn't uh, really look at it. And all of a sudden, you know, toward the end of the day, something said to open it. And so I did open it. And in, in it, I found inside there were two paper, paperback copies of a book. Um, along with a CD and a letter from the author. And the title of the book, uh, the two paperbacks, were God Smiles for Me. And there's a subtitle on it, Why Death Could Not Hold Me. 
and it's authored by Raymond Burroughs. And the guy actually happens to be fairly local. He lives in Lake Jackson. And um, I had been thinking about uh, possibly talking on the topic of life, death, eternal life, some approach on a, on a Sunday as I was looking ahead. And um, so it, it intrigued me. So I took the CD home that Thursday night, listened to it, and uh, it was, it was ra rather captivating. The CD was actually an interview of this author um, on a radio talk show. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, you know, lots of books come to me, and um, I can't I always get to read all of them with my time. And so um, um, in this, this one, I actually found the time immediately to start reading it um, late Friday. And then I picked up and read the rest of it on Saturday morning. Um, as I was praying and meditating and researching as to what I would talk about for Sunday. And I was reading at the, the kitchen table, which I normally don't do. I'm usually up in my office or um, somewhere upstairs like that. And um, anyway, I was, I was reading and I was fishtailing uh, uh, on whether to really share this or not, go this direction or not. And um, so I just con continued to read. And as, as I did, you know, tears. I had to wipe tears away at times as I read this book. And uh, the book is actually the author's personal experience of being uh, diagnosed with a, a monstrous tumor that was invading and taking over um, in his brain and brain and pushing against the brain stem. And uh, when they did find it, he was only given weeks or even possibly days. They didn't know it was so severe uh, to live. And uh, this was in 1975 that this happened. And this gentleman was 33 years old at the time. And he had just moved uh, like six months before uh, to Lake Jackson. And he was a successful architect and uh, who's on the top of his life. He had a beautiful wife, Pat, and two children, um, an eight-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. And uh, the neurosurgeon was predicting for him basically death or worse. And uh, the story goes through where he went through the process of, of accepting and dealing with, you know, accepting this blow in his life at that time. And, and, and then also sharing many miracles that really reflected the, the movement of God or God's presence throughout the experience is, is amazing. And it included eventually a surgery of 16 hours. Uh, that it was a kind of surgery that normally would take seven. Um, so it was more than double. And uh, he has an out-of-body experience and a near-death experience during the surgery. And he tells about that. And, he, and he, he returns out of the surgery with a disfigured face because it had it nip, nipped a, a, a nerve or something. And uh, he was blind in one eye. And, and they had to do a later surgery to return sight to the eye and were able to. And, uh, but there are many other challenges along the way. And, and it was just a powerful story because this was, uh, you, could, you could hear in this man's voice uh, the sensitivity and the depth of, of where he had come through, going through that, and how he had really connected with God. You could hear it in his voice and, um, and feel his heart, uh, just even on that CD. And so uh, I was led to share uh, this story uh, this morning. After all the fishtailing I did, I finally came to a clear guidance that I was. And part of it was because I know that um, you know, not all of us are facing that massive a challenge as this, but, but the, way he, the things that are the take homes that I found that he did uh, were so beneficial. But also, some of us do have big challenges. I know that, that some of you have uh, faced a cancer or are and uh, faced surgeries and are facing surgeries. And um, some of you have had, and several of you I know have had uh, brain surgery and um, overcome that. And so, you know, and there may be people I don't know that are facing these challenges, whether it's in this audience or our TV audience. Uh, but hopefully this can be helpful. Um, I found in this uh, man's story lots of places where I heard the divine saying, now that's what I'm talking about, you know? And that's what it kind of said to me. Whether it be the power of prayer, uh, whether it be uh, the ability to surrender one's self totally to whatever is happening in one's life, surrendering to God, uh, whether it be ac accessing God's help with a consistency, whether it be uh, finding courage, inner strength, uh, guidance, uh, all of these different things that uh, come up when you deal with something of that magnitude in your life. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> you know, he, he found this out by simply uh, going to his local doctor and, 
having a routine hearing test. He was having hearing problems, and, and the doctor noticed that he had some unusual symptoms, and then uh, it went from there, and they diagnosed this, this tumor that was pressing on his brainstem, and they basically told him that there wasn't much that he could do. So he drove to, um, to the beach, and uh, all alone, and um, somewhere on the beach there, and parked on the sand, and waded out in his pinstripe suit and his power tie and his expensive shoes. We waded right out into the surf. And um, it was there that he simply raised his fist into the air and shouted to the heavens, God, I'm going to beat this thing. And he was angry. There was a lot of anger in him. And he went back to his car. And uh, he had parked there on the sand. And he stomped on the accelerator and discovered he was stuck in the sand and he couldn't get out. He turned off the car and just fell over the steering wheel, sobbing. He doesn't know how long he stayed there crying, um, but eventually uh, he got out of the car again, and this, there was a beautiful sunset about then, and he was past his anger, and um, he went back into the surf with his clothes again and um, said prayerfully, God, if it's your will, we're going to beat this thing. And when we do, he promised, I'll tell the world. There were a lot of things that stood in the way, and he didn't get around to begin to start telling the world until recently. Um, he, he's beginning to speak and has written this book. And I'm helping him, as I've been guided to help him tell the world, because it spoke to me. And um, he said that when he said that prayer out there in the Gulf, in the surf, that something changed, something shifted. He felt it internally, and he said, from that moment on, he never felt afraid about what he was facing. He was not afraid, and he said he never felt alone uh, the rest of the way. He said somehow he knew in his mind and his heart, his soul, that with God's help, whatever was to come, you know, that somehow they would handle it together, and, uh, and that God was in charge, and and it was his will be done, whatever it was. And so he accepted whatever would be the outcome. If it meant to, pass, to move on, OK. If it meant to stay, OK. But he, he knew still always what was possible. And so he went back um, to his car, got in it, and, and, and drove off. And uh, when he hit pavement, all of a sudden he remembered he had been stuck in the sand. <laughs> and so his first miracle was a statement that somehow, unbeknownst to him, he was set free of the sand. And it was almost a statement to him that he was going to be set free somehow down the road um, in this as well. And so he tells about how he was led to find a radiologist at the Houston Med Center. This is in 1975, um, and to evaluate uh, his alternatives. And he was told there that they had just acquired very recently uh, a, a newly invented machine, um, and it was called a, a CAT scan. And uh, that this was a new machine that would be able to map and locate the extent of his tumor in minutes. It was a sort of a miracle that that had, machine had just come in at that time. And so it was there that he learned actually how bad it was <laughs> um, and that he had only really days or weeks to live. And it also he was told that it was inoperable. And so he was sent home uh, to make the best of his remaining days and um, with his children and his wife and friends. And then another thing happened. Just a couple days later, the radiologist called on the phone and said he had found a neurosurgeon in California and who had developed a technique of microsurgery that allowed him to operate on sensitive nerves and things where others could not, and uh, that it was a big risk. And so in a conference call uh, with this California surgeon, he was told by the California surgeon it would take him at least 90 days before he could work him in. And so Dre's on the phone, you know, and he says, because, you know, he had set a date. He was going to be marrying Miss Sweden. This is a true story. Uh, a beauty queen. And, um, and that they were going to be touring the continent for six weeks on a honeymoon. He also said that he was waiting still for special instruments that, uh, and microscopes that he had ordered from uh, the Dutch, a Dutch company that had been ordered for over a year. And he was still waiting for those to be delivered to do the intricacy of that kind of a surgery. And so Ray, when he heard that he was not going to be available for 90 days because he was going to get married, slammed the phone down. He was angry because he knew. I'll be dead. He only was given days, 
maybe a week's. And uh, so again, he gathered himself and went into prayer. And that night in, uh, at bedtime, he gave a prayer of thanksgiving for all that he had to be thankful for. And he had, had a, a, gave a prayer for courage and a prayer for acceptance of what lie ahead and a prayer for the welfare of his family. And then what brought him comfort most was the prayer uh, that God's will be done, uh, that God was in this with him. And that night, um, he had significant dreams that he tells about in the story. And uh, he woke up the next morning, and sometime that morning, the phone rang, and it was the radiologist. And he and the California doctor were on the line on a conference call again, and that they were telling him that, that special micros those special microscopes, the special order, uh, had just arrived, that he had been waiting for almost two years for. And uh, they were among the best optical instruments in the world. And for whatever reason, he's named Dr. Morris. I don't know if he changed the names, uh, if Ray did the author or not. Um, but he, for some reason, was anxious to use these instruments and was choosing to delay his wedding. What are the odds of that happening? <laughs> the next day, after slamming it down. And so um, he had lots of people praying for him everywhere. He had friends all over um, through his work and his community. And on the flight to California uh, for the surgery, he had, you know, he was thinking about thoughts about life and death and life after death and all of that. And uh, he, he said he believed that everything happens directly or indirectly. Uh, it, it plays a part in God's plan of our evolution, the evolution of mankind and our, our freeing, our, he used the term salvation. And um, he said, I don't think God gave me the tumor. But I do believe, he said, what I do believe is once I had the tumor, God showed me the way to handle the crisis and helped me realize even this could be used somehow in a positive way, a learning way, a deepening way. And so they did the surgery, um, and it took 16 hours. It was very long, grueling because of the sensitivity of it and the sophistication of the equipment used and all that. And so what happened was they would go in, and his heart would be stopping on occasion. And so the first time they went in, and he was uh, at a point, uh, Ray's heart stopped, and the doctor decided, had to decide right then and there, will we close him up? We don't want to you know, have him die on the table, so we may just back off. But he had to make that decision, his first decision that he stopped, and once the heart started beating in, they decided to go on and keep going. The second time it happened, it was basically, they were already 11 hours into the surgery, and uh, they decided that they would no longer go on, that they were exhausted, it was no use, and uh, when the heart began to beat again and was restored. He ordered the assistants and nurses to close him up. And then as he was walking away and turned uh, away, there was a surge of energy, a surge of something that went through him. Uh, they said it was as if a, a, a power uh, uh, outside himself or God uh, had willed him to go back. And so he did. And uh, so they continued on. And then a third time his heart stopped. And when it did this time, this doctor kind of knew that God was working here, and it didn't alarm him. He just paused, looked at the monitor, waited for it to start beating again, and went on. <laughs> Later, the doctor said to him, you should have died, Ray. Uh, it's a miracle that you're here. And uh, the seasoned surgical team, you know, they testified afterwards that they felt that the very presence of God was there in that room. They felt it. And they had never seen this doctor perform at the height and the precision that he had. And each of them reached a point, they said, in the surgery where they were exhausted. They wanted to quit. These assistants, these nurses, they wanted to collapse from the strain. And each of them said they experienced a surge, a resurgence of energy, an infusion of power that came to them. And they believed every one of them came from God. And his recovery, Ray's recovery, was long and, and painful. And uh, he had the one side of his face that uh, had collapsed uh, due to a nerve impact. And uh, 
it affected his sight, and he was blind in one eye uh, for a time. And he didn't know at that time he would have that sight returned through another operation. But uh, it was a low point. He was very low, de very depressed. And he was in the, in the hospital room, and he, he had the one good eye, and there was a, a, a window there. And a, a little sparrow hit the window and fluttered down and quickly recovered and remained on the ledge and went about the business of pecking and eating some insects and whatnot. And then uh, at, at some point, he looked up at Ray and uh, lifted his head and, and chirped a happy song. And he, Ray, Ray just started crying. He said, it, and, and then it flew off. He said it was as though God put that bird there. To, and the interesting thing, I almost forgot to tell you, the bird had only one eye. It had been poked out, OK? And uh, so it was like, here he was, and here the bird was, and it sang a happy song. And it was a message to him to keep on, keep it on, persevere. Um, have the tenacity. And so Ray lists in the book 21 miracles that he listed uh, during the course of this whole ordeal in which he recognized the grace of God. And that's an important thing that we do is in many ways God is there and we fail to recognize it. And we need to, we, we need to recognize it because when we do, there are more of them. And that's the way it works. And uh, anyway, during this surgery, he, um, his heart stopped. And uh, he... It was somewhere between the first and third time that his heart stopped. He left his body and uh, was outside of it. And uh, he said he watched for a long time, almost in, in indifference uh, at them doing the surgery on him. And then he said then, all of a sudden, he began moving and at great speed into a great void at incredible speed. And he said he described it not as some people talk about a tunnel. He said this was like a narrow valley. And he said there was a pinpoint of light way far away, and there was a rushing sound, and there was, he said he heard the singing of like angels' songs. He was very beautiful. And then he also said, he said, all this wisdom all around him, like voices or thought transference, he said he knew the past, the present, and the future. It was all melded together in one in, in, in that time. And he said he understood everything, and that the voices of, of wisdom of a millennium were coming at him with such clarity. He said, providing an answer to every question he had ever had or imagined. And he said, every question that ever was asked by mankind uh, all came, and he, he seemed to, to know that. He remembered that state. Of course, he wasn't able to bring it back, so we can't ring him up for answers today. <laughs> but uh, he said his body was gradually becoming translucent. The more that he was approaching the light in the motion, in the movement, then he was looking at his hands, and they became more translucent because he was becoming more one with the light. And it was then that his grandfather appeared, and he tells a story about how close his grandfather was when he was young and the impact that he had in him and guiding him and, and steering him and, and just planting seeds of, of truth and, and strength in him. And it was his grandfather that said, you're going to have to go back. And it was that moment he had his thoughts come in about his wife, beautiful wife, and, and his children and, and friends, and his, it went to his heart. And as though it was a beautiful place and so beautiful and so peaceful and he didn't want to leave, he also, he said in his mind, knew he came to the place he needed to go back in things to do and things incomplete. And with that, fee with, with that thought, the speed of his return, he said, was a, like a lightning bolt slamming back into his body. And he was then back, you know, racked into the discomfort of what he was dealing with. And he had to go through a recovery, not only physically, but psychologically. All that he had to do, he thought he was very ugly when he looked in the mirror and his face had collapsed. And all these things, he had to learn not only to walk, but to talk, because it had affected uh, part of his tongue. And, um, uh, but he, he came to grips with all of that and uh, realizing, said that by the grace of God, he was still on this earth and that his life could be better. It could be better than it ever had been. But it was really up to him to overcome the barriers and to direct his thoughts, not to what was bad, but to what was good and could be good. And he came to that realization. The doctor said and shared with Ray that his survival was the greatest miracle he had ever witnessed in his entire career up to that point in time. And it gave him renewed strength and courage to carry on in a very exhausting and stressful kind of career. The other thing he thanked him for was he didn't marry the Swedish <laughs> lady. That he, he came to realize that would have been a big mistake, so he thanked him for that. And, uh, <laughs> Now, all of this is some a reminder to me, you know, a flashback of my daughter, Star, how things come together. She was in a big car accident, was life-flighted, uh, and her, she had her heart 
uh, her liver severed from her heart, and you normally bleed to death in uh, several minutes. And somehow that held together. The angels were watching over her. God was, and they found her at the hospital after life flighting in this state. Just uh, enough blood to have kept a breath. And uh, they didn't know how to fix it because nobody survives this kind of a tear. The, the opening or connection is so small. But somebody knew of a doctor or two doctors in San Francisco that had recently done that surgery. They called him on the phone. And over the phone, they were directing the, the surgeons in Lubbock, Texas, where my daughter was a sophomore in college. And uh, they, uh, she survived for that. Today, she's a nurse, has been for about 10 years. Um, and she is becoming um, a nurse practitioner at this time as well. So God has a plan for all of us, and we never know when what hits us, really, uh, what the outcome may be. But Ray had a number of takeaways, and, um, and, and, and you know, in, including fulfilling his promise of taking this to the world. But um, it was so much about acceptance and, and trusting God and, um, and the experience. But he said he became aware that, that God gave each of us a choice as to how we will spend our time here on Earth. And he said he came, uh, became acutely aware of the value of his limited time here on Earth and became conscious of getting truly the most out of that life that he had been given. He said that God has, given, uh, uh, has a purpose for each of us, of course, in the universal plan uh, for all. He said the key is doing the right thing the right way for the right reasons and giving God the credit. And he said, you know, having lost his smile was difficult, and, um, you know, people tend to judge it's human nature. Um, but he, he said, you know, it's human nature to question what is different about each other without taking the time to understand why or what uh, someone or something, why they're different. And whether it's bigotry or prejudice or a, a just distance for a distaste for the unfamiliar. Uh, he said, we're missing the opportunity to understand and support. Uh, uh, another individual who more, most probably really needs that support and understanding. We all have feelings. We all want to be loved. We all have the need to be understood. He also said we are all God's creation, and we are all beloved children of God. It's important to really realize that. Through the process, he reevaluated his life. He reestablished the order of his priorities, where he was chasing the dreams of wealth and success at one time with his family taking a back seat. He changed some of that around. He made a pact uh, consciously with God that God was the chairman of the board of his life and that every decision that he'd make from that point forward was after the consultation with the divine. Now, I was strongly guided to share this with you this morning, this story, because it impacted me in so many ways and inspired me. Uh, whether it's a, a, a small challenge or a great one, God is always with you. The power of prayer, the strength you can draw on, the, the, the grace of God at work all the time. You know, and, and I was fishtailing as I read that story at the kitchen table yesterday morning, deciding whether I would share this or not as my lesson. And when I, I came to the end of the book, the last chapter, the final line, read the last word. I mean, on the moment my eye hit the last word of that last line, bam, a bird hit the window in the kitchen <laughs> where I never spend my Saturday mornings. And it said to me that God was saying, now that's what I'm talking about <laughs> tomorrow. God bless you. True story. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. At Unity, we believe that God's presence of love and goodness is everywhere and that life is meant to be good. You can find out more about Unity and our teachings at unityhouston.org.